So welcome everybody. I know I'm between you and the dinner break, so to speak. But don't worry, you are also between me and, and my, my breakfast break, so to speak. It's just 7 a.m. here in the, on the West Coast. My kids just woke up and I, I hope I will have some way of keeping them at bay. But you may see them walk in here and there's nothing I can do about that. University is closed. We are in the second wave of lockdown because we thought we are smarter than everybody else. But today, in this very last session of the GISRO conference, I would like to give you a hopefully entertaining overview about the work of my students and myself. And I'm going to provide you, a, you know, a broadly brushed outline of what we are doing, some a little bit older from the past few years, some just published um, really weeks ago, and I hope you will enjoy it. If there's anything unclear, you can, of course, ask afterwards. Otherwise, just, you know, ask in between i can't see you because i'm on full screen so you just have to to shout at me so to speak and of course i'm very very glad for andrea's introduction and for being here with you digitally so there's this very famous quote that i'm sure you're all aware of from the spatial term or about the spatial term i'm using a slightly modified version here namely that space and time matter not only for the obvious reason that everything happens somewhere and at some time but because knowing where and when things happen is crucial to understanding why they happened or will happen in the first place. And I think that's not only very true, it's also a very timely statement. And I believe that this statement explains a lot of the interest that we are seeing in the US, but I'm sure also globally in interest in spatial data science, spatial analytics, and so on at decision makers in government organizations, but especially also in the industry from the very, very large to the small. But you still don't see many of these outcomes of these spatial data analytics or spatial data decision um, research. It hasn't really trickled down, despite all these interests, into everyday applications. And it's an interesting question to try to figure out what could be causing this? What's the case? Why or what's the reason why that hasn't happened yet? And Actually, that's a very well-known problem. It goes by very many different names, for instance, the knowledge acquisition bottleneck. But in the nutshell, it describes the phenomenon or the problem that I'm sure most of you are well aware of, that the majority of the resources of a project, be this person power, time, budget, and so on, goes into data retrieval, data entry, data apportionment, data cleaning, instead of the actual analysis. Many people say it's as bad as 80-20. So 80% 80 of all your resources in a data analytics project go on the or into pre-processing data and only 20% into the actual insight. So the reason why you came in the first place, so to speak. I'm sure you're going to, to agree with me if I said that's unacceptable, right? So many solutions have been developed or partial solutions for this before. In our realm here in geographic information systems and sciences, one such partial solution is called geo-enrichment, and many of you may be familiar with it. So the basic idea in the nutshell of geo-enrichment is that an analyst can take their own study area with the limited information that they have about the study area, then reach out to some web service, some service on the cloud, so to speak, and that then get streaming on-demand access to all sorts of interesting contextual information about this study area directly back into their geographic information system and then can do whatever analytics they would like to do. Here you have an example from the Thomas fire that devastated our local community here in Santa Barbara just about two and a half years ago. The image that you see there, that's not stock photography, that's from my window. It's not from the Thomas fire, it's from the fire season or the fire season after that. But these fires can get pretty scary. They, they reduce the air quality to a degree where you better leave town. And of course, people have to evacuate or may even lose their homes or in the worst case, their lives, right? So ideally, instead of having to download very large data sets about the fire, about the population being affected about from the fire, from previous fires and so on and so forth, you could get streaming access to this. This would mean that your data is always up to date. You don't have to trust or you don't have to study whether you trust a specific data source becomes, because it comes from a predefined vendor and so on and so forth. So in this particular case here, I enriched the fire perimeter of the Thomas fire 
with additional information, in this case, demographic data from the cloud, in this case, from our collaborator, ESRI's G Enrichment Service, to see how many people in a certain sub area here do have a smartphone, which of course is key for evacuation messages, and how many of them are seniors, which here is defined by the age of 65 and more, which means they may have trouble easily evacuating by themselves. So in many regards, G enrichment is regarded as a game changer, or it can be regarded as a game changer for this problem of data acquisition that I introduced you before. But not all is so easy, actually, if you look into the details. So let's go through the pros and cons quite quickly here. So on the pro side, you get streaming access to on-demand data, which especially in this big data age, so to speak, is very important because you don't have to download tons of data and then have them sit on your hard disk and age day by day. You always get the newest update, in theory at least. The data is also well curated, especially in this age of fake news or us having to question what is the motivation for somebody putting out the data set. You know that the data set, in this case at least from S3, comes from a very trusted, reputable data source. The data is also pre-apportioned. What we mean by that is that it's tailored to your specific study area. You're not just downloading data that um, is, you know, assigned to a certain bounding box or, or the viewport of your GIS. It's specifically tailored by some algorithms to the polygons, for instance, a fire parameter that I have selected there. And at least in terms of asterisk geo-enrichment, it's directly ready for consumption in a geographic information system. We also work with other collaborators. We're going to start to work. We have an interesting project with a company called Cibo Technologies. They do something similar for land, health, and parcels and soil where you can enrich information about parcels to be able to um, estimate their future yield and stuff like this. Here, by the way, also has a G-enrichment service, SS, SAP, and so on. So on the con side, all these nice things that I just told you are only true for a very, very, very small set of predefined categories. Quite frankly, for ESRI, it's largely or almost exclusively um, demographic factors, a little bit mixed with, with landforms data. For CBO, it's just climate and elevation data for soil and so on and so forth. So you can't easily do this for data that may interest you, but is not yet part of some system. Then, of course, you're essentially buying into a closed data, data silo, right? You just get access to their data, you have to trust them, and you can't easily reach out and get new data or get the data as much up to date as you would like to. I would have loved to show you another fire, not in Santa Barbara, but in Paradise, that became the largest fire after the Thomas fire, but it wasn't there yet, because no matter how big these companies are and how many resources they put into this, this is the old battle to speak between the Wikipedias and the Encyclopedias Britannicas. No single commercial entity can hold the data that may be relevant to all use cases at all time and keep them at high quality and up to date. Then also the data is quite flat and tabular, which means that you can't do any follow-up queries. Once you download the data and rich data, you're really hitting a wall. You can't say, oh, that's interesting. And now something more about, for instance, those citizens in this affected area. And of course, there are other issues that are close to my heart and that we have started to look at is how representative are these data? Are there any hidden biases and so on? But I'm not going to go into this uh, too deeply today. So in a nutshell, what we really need here is we need some technology or some novel paradigms or ideas that combine all the strengths of geo-enrichment, namely having data at your fingertips, so to speak, with an open, densely integrated cross-domain data repository that can give you freely and openly access to all other sorts of data that may be relevant for your research interests, for your research questions across domains, and ideally is not restricted to a GIS, but any open um, platform, be it R or something else. So enter knowledge graphs. There is potential for a technology that can fulfill some of those roles. And let me briefly walk you through what I mean by that. I'm sure many of you have seen this graph here before. I apologize, but just to put all of us on the same playing field, this is such a knowledge graph 
more formally a knowledge graph is an edge and node labeled directed multigraph. But in the essence, it's taking the idea of the World Wide Web as you know it today, where you have links between documents to a web of, as we say, a web of data, where the links that you create are not only named and directed, but they are also between individual statements. So for instance, saying that London is part of England. The publicly or openly available part of the largest knowledge graph in existence is called the Linked Data Cloud. Last time I checked, it consisted of more than 150 billion triples, each triple being an individual statement like me just giving a keynote, Santa Barbara being part of California and so on and so forth distributed over 10,000 data sources or more. And this is just a diffraction of those people who care to let this platform that counts how many data sets are there know that they exist and that they are still up to date. So in reality, there's probably substantially more, even if it's not very stable at times. The private part of this linked data cloud powers a lot of the revolution that you see in the Bay Area right now, be it's Google's new search engine, Siri, IBM's Watson, and many, many others. In this particular case, this technology is based on semantic web technologies, but that doesn't really matter. You could take any other form of technologies, property graphs, whatever you like. So let's dive a little bit deeper into how such a knowledge graph actually looks like. So what you see here is a snapshot what from DBpedia, one part of this knowledge graph, in fact, one of the central bubbles in this knowledge graph that I've shown you before, and you see that I'm expanding some information, you know, looking into the graph by looking at information about London, England, and for instance, the mayor of London. And as you can easily see here, you are being overwhelmed by information for London alone. My query yesterday timed out after a few thousand. So they are easily what we know from other cities, tens of thousands of individual statements about London. Some may be very trivial saying London part of England, London is something specific, namely it's a city. And some are very detailed about historic figures in London, the mayor of London, demographics, climate, really everything, actors, really everything you can think of, important events and so on. So to make sure you can really do this not only for one central data set, in this case, DBpedia, but you can do this for the entire graph and then really reach out and traverse this ginormous linked data knowledge graph to find interesting information. You, of course, need some way of saying that certain nodes are the same so that you can say this London in DBpedia is the same London as, let's say, the one over here in GeoNames, Wikidata, or whatever data source you would like to use. And this requires a set of, of technologies. One of them is called formal vocabularies. They also go by the scary name of ontologies. And they essentially define what certain terminology means. For instance, what does part of mean? And what can we formally state about the relation of patonomy? For instance, that it is transitive. Or what does it mean to be a city compared to a town and so on and so forth? I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes. So before we dive a little bit into what we have in mind here, what we are trying to do over the next few years with these knowledge graphs for G-enrichment, let me talk a little bit about knowledge graphs or graphs more specifically or more generally, in fact, I'm sorry, and why I think they are a very relevant format for representing geodata. And whenever I give talks like this, there's a little bit of question marks on people's faces or they ask afterward and say, is this really spatial or is this really geodata? So let me clear this up and I hope this slide will, will provide some context of what we are working on and what we have in mind here geodata should look like. So very clearly you can use such a such a graph to just model metric property like Los Angeles being roughly 90 miles away from Santa Barbara. And you can do this of course with London and all the other places you would like. I think it's very clear that this is spatial information represented in a graph form. Whether you really need a graph form for that, um, that's another question. Of course, you can do the very same and say, looking from the viewpoint of Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, it's to its east. So this would be a directional relation. Also, I hope you all agree with me that's a spatial view on life and that's clearly geodata. You can also look at it topologically and say that Santa Barbara and Los Angeles are both in the inverse 
contained relation, contains relation to the state of California. So basically you have a topological relation or depending on your flavor of ontology, a merit topological relation or administrative hierarchy or whatever you'd like to call it. Now we are moving a little bit away from the spatial aspect to what we call the place-based or the placial aspect because strictly speaking you never needed any sort of coordinates for this as long as you declare these statements. So now we can look at to metrically refined topological information. Great work there from, from uh, Max Egenhofer, for instance, that you can check. The typical examples would be that a river is flying by, is flowing by um, a city, of course. If you say that the city is adjacent to the river, they are not really touching because you know all the water would spill into the, the houses of those poor folks living there. So we say that you know they take a give a few meters or a few hundred meters that still are allowed to be between them and those topological relations would still hold. I took the freedom here to take a little bit, to took a little bit of a of the liberty to broad this for, for my slides, just to make sure I show you also some event data. So the yellow ones, those were places, but now we can say there's the Thomas fire that I just introduced to you and it affected the community or the county of Santa Barbara. And that's also a metrically refined topological in a placial, in a place-based sense at least. But now one of those fillers of the graph suddenly is an event and not a place anymore. Then of course you can take this further. Now I'm going to blend a few things here to speed this up. Namely, you can say that Los Angeles is known for the movie industry. I'm sure you all agree. And Santa Barbara is also known for the movie industry. So first of all, now the graph has geographic information, but it links it not to event information, which I'm sure you would agree is also highly geo or spatial, or however you'd like to call it, but to what I would call an information object, namely a topic, the topic of the new movie industry. And there's a second interesting thing going on here, namely when I say that Santa Barbara is known for the movie industry, maybe you're thinking, well, only because you live in Santa Barbara and you want to be proud of your local community, right? Not of any movie industry in Santa Barbara. Well, you would be right in 2020, but what you may not know is that before there was Hollywood in Los Angeles, so to speak, Santa Barbara was the Hollywood, so to speak, of the movie industry, of the silent movie industry. Charlie Chaplin had a hotel here in town that's still standing. All the big movies were done here. But then when the silent movie industry you know, hit the roadblock and silent movies weren't on vogue anymore, everything moved to LA also after a horrible earthquake here. So why this brief lesson in, in the history of California? Well, because I want to say that there are certain statements within these graphs that are true right now, and then there are other statements within this graph that are what we say temporarily scoped. So they were true at some stage, not true anymore. And you can play the same, which is rather um, a very you know, up and coming topic on people's radar, especially that some statements are only true in one region of the world and others are only true in another region of the world. The typical example that you're getting then is the borders of the Kashmir region, depending on whether you're in India, Pakistan or China and you ask what's the border of the Kashmir region or what's the border of these three countries, you're always going to get a different reply. All of them are correct, so to speak. The borders are just contested. So this is a case of spatially scoping data. But I wanted to give you an, an even more abstract example to show you how geo or how place or how space can matter in such knowledge graphs that maybe is less obvious. We talked before about this predicate of London being a city. So if you talk about cities and towns and villages, you typically assume cities are the big ones, towns are the smaller ones, villages are the smallest. And in many states in the US, this is defined by population science. In Utah, I believe, if you hit more than a thousand people living in a town, then the town becomes a city. And each state basically gets their own definition. But in the state of California, by law, town and city are exactly the same. They're equivalent classes, so to speak, which means Santa Barbara is a town in a city and Los Angeles, despite being ginormous, is also a town. But this equivalent, so to speak, of the term city and town meaning just the same is only true for the state of California. Once you leave, that's no longer true. So I hope I walked you a little bit through the spectrum of what could be considered geodata from the very spatial to the placial 
to the meta, so to the ontology level in a graph representation, hoping to remind you that in knowledge graphs and in geodata, there's way more than just geometric primitives on the vector side and tessellations on the raster side. Clearly, I hope you agree with me, those zero degree examples that I've shown you here, Los Angeles is 90 miles from Central are spatial. But in the following, I will also try to convince you that there's also interest in N degree spatial relations. So data sets that have some geographic component and then a lot of components that may not be geographic and then they link again back to some geographic component. I'm going to show you examples later. This is something that GIS can't handle today, but I think there's a lot of interesting questions to be answered there. So knowledge graphs in a nutshell are a promising technology to handle these cases where you have n degree path queries or queries that hop over multiple stations of this graph and some of the stations traversed are non-spatial or non-geographic, something as I said that geographic information systems can't handle to date. So what did I really mean there by the, by the zero degree and n degree and so forth? Let me give you a few examples on the template level, on the ontology level, so to speak. So zero degree, and you can also call this one degree, I don't care, that's not, not relevant here, would be something that a place occupies a certain location in space and then to this location, you can assign different um, geographic coordinates and different vector primitives just depending on scale, application area and so on. One degree would be, for instance, that an event took place somewhere, right? Like the Battle of Trafalgar took place at the Cape of Trafalgar, for instance, to use a local example for you guys. So this is first degree because it's about the event that took place somewhere and this somewhere has a location. On the second degree side, you can say that there's music being composed by a person. And then depending on your ontological framework, you can either say that this act of composition took place at a certain location or you can of course say took place at a place and that took place at a location or you can say music was composed by a person which led to the event of composition that took you can you see where this is going so <clears throat> whether this is second degree or third degree is largely a model choice but fourth degree things we looked at really i don't recall the number but like north of 20 million different triples that had some places associated to them. And in no such case, we were able to find any fourth degree spatial entities. Turns out place or you know, geographic locations are so fundamental to our way of thinking, of structuring knowledge, that they become so central parts of these knowledge graphs that you can't, or I wouldn't know how to find something that is more than three or four hops, so to speak, away of being related to a spatial node. And then, of course, you can do all sorts of funny experiments. You can ask yourself, well, according to this way of thinking, people should be first degree spatial, right, or first degree placial, depending on how you would like to see it. Namely, myself, I was born somewhere, in my case, Poznan in Poland, so on and so forth. If you actually do the math, and that's just a funny example to keep you entertained, because I you know this is your closing session, turns out people are a little bit more than one degree spatial on average, if you look at half a million people in DBpedia that we did, they are 1.15 degree spatial. So, you know, that's a very odd thing to say, right? Especially because these, these degrees are, of course, discrete. So what do I mean by that? Well, actually, it's quite interesting because you can start to capture modeling errors in these ginormous knowledge graphs and also modeling errors in the ontologies that underlie these global knowledge graphs so that you can you really traverse between data sets. So here you have, for instance, Terry Fox, and you can see down there that Terry Fox is geolocated on the surface of the Earth down to the individual atoms, so to speak, if I look at the coordinate precision there. Um, and of course, this is not how people should be represented in any sort of stable you know, encyclopedic data source. Keep in mind, this is not tracking somebody moving up and down all the time. This is, you know, they are their location is part of an encyclopedic entry. So obviously something is at odd here. This happens in roughly 0.2% of all the people we looked at that they are zero degree. So what did happen here? Well, very often the place where people were born or most often where they died is confused with 
giving people a location, what should be done is that we should say that there's a person, that this person died in, for instance, London at this cemetery, and that's the location of that cemetery, right? But the person is such, especially if they are dead since hundreds of years, doesn't have exact geographic coordinates. In this case, it was even funnier. This was the location of a park in Canada named in honor of Terry Fox. So how they send it there, I don't know, but it's clearly a way to spot data errors. So this is the zero degree people. That brings us to the part, what are the two degree people, so to speak, in those knowledge graphs. And those are largely fictional or historic characters. And the more of these graphs grow, the more of these we get. So for instance, if you watch your favorite TV show and everybody else likes it as well, there will be two entries, one entry for the actor and the second entry for the character being played. And of course, just in the case here of Ronald McDonald that I put out there for your entertainment, Ronald McDonald is a second degree person simply because Ronald McDonald was invented by somebody, that's the first degree, and this somebody then is a, is a person that has or can be related to a place that then has geographic location. So this would be here, Willard Scott, for example, the person who invented, among many other things, Ronald McDonald. So aside of these, of these funny things that I just used to, to explain to you, knowledge graphs are of interest and why they're highly geospatial and why geospatial or geographic knowledge and technologies are super important to really densely integrate knowledge graphs. Let's very briefly talk about the side of ontologies here. So of these things that keep these knowledge graphs together. This is a big topic in its own right. This is, in fact, one of the things that I get very excited about and everybody else gets quite bored about, maybe you're even closing down your laptop as you see the slide. Don't worry, no panic. This is not going to be an ontology talk, but just in a nutshell, ontologies are formal theories. In our case here, described in a subset of first order logic called description logic, which has the benefit that they are decidable in finite time and you can make some or you can derive some axioms that declare, for instance, what a trajectory is, whether it's a trajectory of a human moving, a trajectory of an airplane, or even the trajectory of something unfolding, like, for instance, of a hurricane, which is often represented as an event as such. And you can see some of the axioms. It's a small ontology. You can see most of them here that tell you, for instance, that they are fixes and the fixes that they form together segments and the segments are traversed by something, whether it's you walking or driving a car, you can get the location of the fixes from some device, the locations can be a position, some of those positions are places and so on and so forth. But what I think is more interesting here, and what I would like to show this here, is that in terms of the these highly heterogeneous global graphs of data that contain, you know, everything from from history to fiction, from soil to space, all sorts of data from all sorts of perspectives. And hopefully also, you know, from us as a global community is also quite contradicting, for instance, political statements and so on and so forth. Whether there are some sort of patterns that emerge, and of course, we are largely interested in, in geographic patterns. So one way to see whether the ontology or the tiny ontology that I just showed you is really useful in such a knowledge graph setting, which means it can be reused by many others, is to check whether you can use it for many cases. In our case, we showed you can use it for humans, for planes, for hurricanes, whatever you like. And you can also give it different levels of granularity. You can say, for instance, that Santa Barbara is a fix, Los Angeles is a fix, and the segment between that traversed by a car is Highway 101, for instance. Then you have a very abstract representation or you can say that you would really like to get as concrete as possible and really track the, the trajectory and then just say that you're going to sample every 10 seconds and then you see exactly me driving on the highway, for instance. And of course, you can do all sorts of stuff like I'm showing you here, for instance, that some of those fixes are created by the navigation system of my car, then a car, and then there are geosocial check-ins or something like this. I'm hearing a bing. In the background, I hope you can still hear me. Otherwise, Andrea, let me know somehow. So yes, those yes. ontology I, I, patterns, I very good. Those ontology patterns that are, or those ontologies or schema that are reused quite frequently in many parts of those graphs, 
those we call schema patterns or ontology design patterns, for instance, and they help us to foster retrieval, reuse, and interoperability on these knowledge graphs. Another similar task that we can ask ourselves is now that this graph is so ginormous, more than 150 billion triples, and I only want to know about some of them, for instance, what I'm going to see on my way from Santa Barbara to Los Angeles, we need to have some way to find a subgraph that is relevant for my current query, my current situation. We call this um, graph or knowledge graph summarization. And then you can go even in a slightly different direction. We are just start, we just started to work with this with my with my student Ray on geomotives, namely asking this time from the bottom up from the inductive side, are there reoccurring or overrepresented patterns in the graphs? For instance, can we detect functional regions from a graph data set? And the relation between those, the schema patterns, the subgraph summaries, so to speak, and the geomotive, so the bottom-up frequent patterns, the relation between them, it's actually quite unclear, interesting research topic. Ask me about it, I'm quite excited about them. And of course, these ontologies can be, get very, very big. Just to show you one brief example here, this is an ontology that we standardized together with OGC and the World Wide Web Consortium for describing all sorts of sensors, observations, samples, and actuators whether this is for satellite imagery or your tiny sensors in an IoT application. So where did this all take us those first, you know, like 30 minutes of the talk? Well, we started with this knowledge acquisition bottleneck, and then we said knowledge graphs may free us, may give us a way to combine geo-enrichment with such an open-ended technology where we can densely interconnect data to some graph, but I haven't actually shown you how to merge this with the G enrichment that I promised in the first place, right? So here's one example of an early prototype that we did in a nutshell as a plug-in in ArcGIS together with the folks at ESRI, where now you can use something like their idea of enrichment. You click on your particular study area, and then instead of getting data from them, you can reach out on the fly to um, the link data cloud as a knowledge graph, then we have to do all sorts of magic, but then you can get streaming data on demand into your GIS. And what's so, I would say, interesting or cool about that is that we never flatten the data into a tabular form. So if you are thinking to yourself, well, that just sounds like a web feature service, just getting data, whether it's a graph or not, that's not what we are doing. We are reconstructing the geo databases before that we did shape files as you go so that you don't have to flatten the, the graph into a tabular form. So you can always do follow-up queries. Here we do an interesting query, namely, show me all regions that are studied by researchers that were influenced by von Humboldt. Something that I think is a very interesting question and totally undoable, so to speak, from the perspective of modern day GIS, because some of those queries and asking, show me the regions which are geographic that are that had been explored by people influenced by von Humboldt, who is, you know, as you know, a famous explorer. Some of these nodes along this past traversal are non-geographic. So currently we are trying to put this into a larger stack because right now you can't do things like pre-apportionment, which means we can only select point locations and then let you query. What we really want to do is that you select some study area like a polygon, for instance, and then you semantically lift this unknown entity, your polygon, to the graph. We have an interesting paper about that. Then, and you would typically do this offline, you would do link prediction to enrich your graph at areas where it's sparse. And then depending on the research question that somebody's having, you're really cutting out from this ginormous graph to which your land parcel or whatever your polygon was is, con is now connected and you would cut it down by using knowledge graph summarization techniques to just the graph that you care about and then get it streaming into your statistical environment, GIS, whatever you like. And we are using this for downstream models in, in food and supply chains with industry partners right now. So with these ideas, we did some brief experiments. I'm not going to walk you through them because I want to, to go to some other topics as well. But just to give you a very, you know, very first impression of the early work we started to do with this, just, you know, to, to see would people be interested in this, for instance, from the side of the industry. So one of the ideas we had there is how often do we have a situation that you have remote sense imagery, whether this is from the from you know from a drone or from a satellite, like Landsat or something like this. 
and you see a, see a scene from the top and you ask yourself, what's, what more is there that I can't see from the sky, so to speak, right? So for instance, you have some data product. In this case, this is a data product that was derived from remote sense information, namely a data product about fire risk. And now looking at the fire risk product, you would like to enrich to automatically load into your product information that you can't see. In this case, for instance, we are selecting previous fires, right? So events that took place before. So if you look at Santa Barbara, for instance, have a remote sense seen a tile of Santa Barbara, you can say, no, show me all the previous landslides, fires, and so on that took place here. Or you can also make another query like, you see clearly the buildings and maybe using segmentation techniques or object classification, you can now cut them out but you can't answer the question, what's inside those buildings? Which year have those buildings been built? What's the room capacity of these buildings? We can do this by connecting you on the fly to such geographic knowledge graphs. And that's what that demo was about. Another thing we did together with industry partners was to use on the fly text enrichment here, for instance, about news. This is actually a very interesting topic, has received a lot of attention recently. There's a company formerly called Open Calais, owned by Reuters. Now they changed the name to something else, I forgot, where you can get all the news articles you want. You can load them into the semantic web tool and it passes out all the people, all the industry players and so on. And then you connect this to the graph and you learn more about them. This is super useful, especially if you're a journalist or if you have to make decisions, for instance, about trading. They also do this for geographic space, but not very well. They don't do any meaningful place name disambiguation. So the London in the UK is always selected over all the other Londons, even if the article is clearly about one of the many Londons, for instance, here in the United States. And they have no idea of this idea of a region, so to speak. So and they can't understand that if this and this and this and this place was mentioned, for instance, all of them in California, then this article would be about California and it would make sense to also show information about California or something like this. So we added this as well. So with roughly six or seven minutes left, let's go a little bit to the dark side of things. All what you saw here, namely this idea of G enriching your own study area by reaching out to this graph, only works in the perfect world where we can easily model what is what, like this is a city, this is a pub, this is a nightclub, this is a movie theater, and that's a crime scene. So now you know, right? But you know, this is not how reality functions. Reality is messy. Many people have different perspectives. Not everybody agrees with their perspectives. Their political divides, their cultural issues, the global north and the global south, they have very different perspectives on what environmental protection should look like and stuff like this. So what we did, and this is what we actually did a couple of years ago, and we are still continue to do this. We develop a technique as an analogy to spectral signatures in remote sensing that essentially takes all sorts of spatial statistics, temporal methods and temporal statistics, and natural language processing technologies, and so on, to do a very, very large scale social sensing experiment, so to speak, where we try to understand geographic features whether these are mountains or valleys or scenic views or restaurants or jails or hospitals, universities, conference rooms, whatever you like. But this time, not bottom, um, not sorry, top down by building this ontology together with experts, but bottom up by observing when do people go to these places? Google has this now as well since a couple of years, but at that time they didn't. And um, what do people say at those places? Like what do they write about this in reviews or news articles? How are these places organized in geographic space? So we try to learn from human behavior. What do those places actually mean bottom up? Because then we can account for small geographic changes like you know, a pub versus a bar. I'm sure you understand what the difference between them is. I don't and in other places, for instance, dinner time or when you go out to a restaurant here in the US, it's quite early. Andrea, if I understand correctly from social media, is in Italy right now, so he's going to have dinner at like 9 p.m. or something like this, right? So our conceptualization of geographic space differs. It should be like this. The top-down view works only quite well if there's a canonical representation. We want to have the full cultural background, so let's learn semantics from data. Not going to dive into this in 
detail, but I just wanted to briefly highlight what we have done with this in the past. We have applied this to the interesting problem of geolocating images. So taking images that you see here, then asking somebody for textual descriptions, like a mechanical Turker would say, I see market, I see food, I see dense population, I see some Asian science, I see economic activity, air conditioning, whatever they would say there. And then we were able to geolocate the space, in this case on our thematic bands of our signatures, we were able to um, advance the state on the art of reverse geocoding using temporal signatures by morphing space in relation to time based on you know, taking some ideas of cartographic distortion into account. We were able, and I hope there's a video playing right now for you, to simulate entire cities, in this case, the larger Los Angeles area, for outlier detection and not trying to make you know, better agent-based models because they are ginormous and our data set is very, very tiny but by showing that you can model the default behavior of places based on understanding how humans behave and then look for outliers in real time. We use this for out-competing existing models for facade classification, so distinguishing what here is a restaurant, hotel, or library. And we also use this for pri geoprivacy, a topic close to my heart, by hoping to have help activists, for instance, understanding how to slightly tweak their tweets and the time they sent them so that they can't be geolocated again. So for instance, a system would take your tweet looking towards tacos and margaritas tonight and just suggest you to send this half an hour later or maybe change tacos to appetizers or something like this automatically. And then this essentially increases entropy and makes it more difficult to find you. So last five minutes in, in this talk about one such example in how to actually do this. And that's an example that is hopefully very simple, but I have a, a, a twist at the end that will hopefully um, make you realize there's interesting work um, to follow for all of us for the next years. So what we did over the, the last, I would say, three-ish years, or maybe four years by now, is when we started to get more serious about machine learning models, we saw that many of the models out there are non-spatial and us as GIS scientists or spatial scientists taking those models and then simply applying them to spatial data. We were quite unhappy with this because these models make very strong assumptions that don't hold for spatial data like linearity and stuff like this. So we started to develop what is called spatially explicit machine learning models and we have shown that we can very dramatically outcompete those more general models when applied to spatial data. But we also ask ourselves, like, what are such spatially explicit models? And actually, there's not much in the literature. The, the best thing, so to speak, at least a few years ago that we were able to identify was something from 2000 by my good child and Don Janel, basically saying a model is spatially explicit. And in this case, they were not really thinking of machine learning models, just like model builder models, so to speak, in your GIS. If it fulfills one of the four criteria and only one, the more the better, but one would be sufficient. If it's invariant, which means it doesn't, the results change under relocation. If geographic primitives somehow are featured in representation. If in the formulation, some spatial concepts are used, something for instance, like Werner Kuhn's core concepts of geographic information. And if the spatial structure of the outcome changes, for instance, you're going from a sample to an interpolated surface. But there really wasn't a lot out there. So I only have like two or three minutes left. So what I wanted to do here is to really very quickly walk you through a very early experiment that we did. And that is so easy that, you know, it fits into a three minute um, presentation. We wanted to see whether we can understand bottom up, right? The semantics, the meanings of place types without knowing anything of them, just following this linguistic idea of distributional semantics, namely that you should know a word by the neighbors it keeps by saying you should know a place type by the place types, so to speak, around it, of course, more, more carefully stated, the instances of these place types. So we wanted to reconstruct place type hierarchies and human understanding of place types only and exclusively on knowing where those places are located. No information about the labels, visitors, what people say, nothing like this, just frequency and popularity. And what we did there, we created concentric circles around our study area and then trained a neural network by resampling how often certain types of places would be presented to them based on this little formula that you see there below. 
but in an essence, the point was that it, it's a little bit inspired by, you can think about it as, you know, being inspired by, uh, by a semi variogram of realizing that things in different distance bins all contribute to your understanding what such a place type actually is at. Going to skip the math here for a second and talk about the evaluation. So once we trained our neural network to distinguish or to predict the certain place types seeing its neighbors around or the other way around, giving a place type predicting the neighbors around that central place type. We wanted to see how good is this in terms of similarity comparison. So we asked mechanical Turkers all sorts of questions. I'm not going into details here. One was select by similarity by using this like Likert-like scales. What's the similarity between bars and nightlife, bars and casinos, bars and electronics, bars and cinemas for all sorts of place types we gave them pairs of three and asked them to pick the one that doesn't fit and so on. And we even took the entire Yelp hierarchy, which has more than a thousand, I believe a thousand thirty place types and asked them to reconstruct certain parts and see how our computer system would do in comparison. Just if you ask yourself, where is the thousand here? What you see labeled there on the right side are just the, the top hierarchies and each tiny note there is another type on itself. So you see in the realm of restaurants alone, there are many um, distinctions made there. And to our big surprise, that actually worked quite well. So first of all, we were easily able to beat, no matter whether you use structure similarity measures like Vupalma or information theoretic, um, information theoretic similarity measures like IC Sanchez, we are easily able to outcompete the more general machine learning models at that time that was word to vec Now there are some more powerful techniques, but the same would still hold true, I guess. But what was most interesting to me, even in the task where we we're trying to, you know, recreate human assessments of similarity, we were able to do this very efficiently, keeping in mind that when humans reason about the similarity of places, they know everything about the places, when they go there, what they do there, how these places are called, what are the places nearby, what are the social you know, characteristics of those places. We knew nothing. We only knew the location of these places. And still we get a very high correlation, rank correlation here of 0 0.7 and also in high interrater agreement using this W. But what really hit me more than you know, us being able to learn an interesting model was that there's one thing that breaks, and I discussed this with Waldo Tobler before he passed away quite passionately. It breaks Tobler's first law a little bit because you would ask yourself if you go down here to this slide that those places very close to your training place in one of those close bins, they would have more meaning, they would contribute more, so to speak, to the, to the learning of what this place is about. But if you look at those concentric rings, and here's the math how we computed them, you will see that clearly the nearby bins were very important, but in the top five of important bins, 17 and 24 are very far out. So there are places that you can only learn about by knowing that certain other places never occur nearby. Again, this breaks Tobler's first law a little bit, quite interesting stuff. One example that I typically use to explain this is that to understand something like a bar, you need to understand that there are near bar, bars nearby and stuff like this. But to understand something like a school, it's not clear what is the place next to a school, maybe a side of a gymnasium or something like this. So we, we learn about schools more from what we never encounter next to schools, namely a jail, for instance, or a police station, at least hopefully. So last two slides and then I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I think I'm already running five minutes late, so I'm sorry for that. Um, it actually led to, a, to an interesting insight that I wanted to briefly share with you. I'm sometimes skeptical that in these, this wonderful new world of machine learning, we only confirm what we know from geographic theory. And I was really in search, you know, for my own sake of sanity, so to speak, for something that wasn't yet in geographic theory and that would just pop out of us doing this um, machine learning work to give me some you know, sense that I'm doing something worthwhile afterwards. And then I, we stumbled on something that, that I think is quite interesting. Namely, we tried to put this back to the summarization task that I mentioned before, so closing the loop of my talk, so to speak. And um, 
we ask ourselves, and initially we did this purely for technical reasons to prevent overfitting. What would happen if we remove parts of this place type hierarchy and then still try to train the entire hierarchy based on our, our place to vec? And it turns out, and those are the numbers that you can see here at the side, you can remove all restaurants and all the subclasses of restaurants and still get the same performance for learning all these embeddings also for the restaurants. In fact, you can take apart large parts of this graph, so never show them in your training stage and still learn them. Of course, you have to have those instances still in your data set, which means that some places can stand in for other places, which reminded me of my future career, which is actually in, in ecology of something like keystone species that are indicators for an ecosystem and their presence tells you everything else about the health, for instance, of an ecosystem. And that's something that hasn't yet been applied to the theory of neighborhoods or place types. It's certainly related to affordance theory, function regions, anchor point theory, activity spaces, but it's quite a novel view, namely, are there certain types of places where the presence of them reveals everything that you need to know about the neighborhood. I'm going to give you one example. And there's State Street, our shopping street here in Santa Barbara. There's Upper State Street and Lower State Street. And there's one part of State Street where all the Hollywood stars go shopping and so on. And then there's one part of State Street, and I'm going to summarize it in one sentence. It has the only adult entertainment store in town. And I'm sure you can now reconstruct most of the structure of the street, the nearby places and so on. So closing example to bring this back to the knowledge graph summarization case, where we are going right now is trying to use this, use this knowledge about the place types in the roads to come up with summaries for neighborhoods, for the funk zone, our new area here in Santa Barbara, that is a remodeled industrial area. One way to characterize it, it's here's the ocean and the pier, here's the train tracks, here's the old industrial area that is, I hope you can see my mouse moving there, that is now filled with wine and arts and pubs and stuff like this, would be to go back to some cool work of Tversky and then of Rodriguez and Egenhofer and say, we are showing you the most common thing about the neighborhoods. It's the place where you go for wine and arts, and then the most distinct thing and to contrast it from all the other places where you can have wine and art, it's actually one way in the middle of you sitting and sipping wine, a train will pass right by you. And that finishes my talk. I'm sorry for running five minutes late. These online talks are a little bit hard to, to time. I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. Great. Thanks, Jano, for an excellent talk as usual. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. So right after this Q&A, there will be the closing um, well, ceremony, if you like. So I think we can eat a few minutes into that uh, if if people don't mind. Uh, so let's start with some questions from the chat. Uh, can you see the, the chat, Jan? It might be easier to actually understand. No, I'm just going to unshare and then I hope yeah, it's yeah. going to Yeah, work. I think that makes sense. So the first question yep. from Anna Baziri, I will just read it out. When we move on on positional geometry component to geospatial data, to geospatial information and knowledge, we're actually exposing ourselves data to a higher level of cognitive and selection bias. My question is, how can we measure the bias and ideally de-bias here if the source of measuring cultural regional differences in the reviews on Google or Yelp, how do we avoid a systematic bias we might insert into our models? Oh, wow. Well, you know, I couldn't, I, I couldn't be more happy with you asking this. This is a topic so close to my heart. So I, you know, this is the this is the next keynote, and you know, Andrea will kick me out, right? So I'm going to try to answer this in just one minute. We actually did this. One one of the motivations for this was to use the the semantic signature, so bottom up learning of place type semantics, because we were fed up by you know a group of folks like me sitting in a room and telling everybody else on the planet how they should should conceptualize the world without asking them, right? Clearly, now that these knowledge graphs are powering your, your, your phones and your question answering on your phones, you want to have a say. So in the bottom-up learning, we actually did together with Grant McKenzie, Song Gao, Ying Ji Hu, and many other great professors now, um, we looked at the regional variability, and roughly half of these signatures uh, show no regional variability. 
and the other half shows very clear regional variability. So we need multiple of those signatures. And the other one, the one about the bias bar, that's such an interesting topic. We have a vision paper because we just started uh, doing this and I can post a link somewhere about de-biasing knowledge graphs. This is very important. Clearly coverage matters, right? The global south is vastly underrepresented. Schema knowledge matters, namely who derives these schema tasks, which view they take, which stances they take, which kind of ontological framework they do, who's the one modeling and so forth takes a role. But one is always forgotten, and that's the what I call the the, the bias coming from the from the inferencing, namely whether this is classical reasoning in an ontological framework or rule binding. We have a paper that shows you that a rule mining system on DBpedia will learn that five-star generals are male. That's actually a thing that you can learn because five-star generals are a closed set. It was only a historic area where they were assigned, they were all male, there's no other, so that's okay. But it will also learn that US presidents, to be, if you are a US president, you are male. And boy, that's not what you want to learn, right? So also on the side of the machinery, there's a lot of things to improve. Thanks again for your question. Great, so the second question is from Puri. Uh, I, I remember some discussions with you and Werner Kuhn about this, so I, um, I think I know the answer. Uh, so hi, Anna, cheers, and thanks for the great talk. You mentioned the limited generalizability of ontologies and or knowledge graphs. Do you think some kind of universal spatial ontologies and or knowledge graph are worth to strive for, or should we aim to be more middle-level ontologies and for more specific purposes? Wow, you guys brought all the good questions. Okay, well, you know, in my career, I went from, I started as a top level ontologist, then I hated on top level ontologies, then I found the middle ground, so to speak. So I'm not going into a debate of, of what's a right or wrong because I simply don't know. What I think I can tell you is that I would love to see low, small local ontologies defined by communities that are interested in their data, that bring their perspective, for instance, their cultural perspective, and then ontology alignments between those so that we can have the full beauty of heterogeneity without losing out on, on um, interoperability. And we have actually quite some interesting work from my student Ray, for instance, or Ging Cheng about uh, ontology alignment using bottom-up approaches. Great, another question from Nick. One of the advantages of geo-enrichment was the trust in the data. How is this dealt with in the knowledge graph? Oh, that's a great question. Unfortunately, not, right? So, well, maybe I shouldn't say unfortunately. I think that's a great thing about knowledge graphs is everybody is free to say whatever they like, right? Which is especially important in this day and age. But of course, this kills one of the key advantages as Nick rightfully points out of you just downloading trustworthy data. And I believe that the entire issue of debiasing knowledge graphs, trying to assign trustworthiness to knowledge graphs, that's some of the of the most important, of the hottest topics, if I may say so, for us also as geospatial scientists, because we know that things that are true here don't need to be true here, and things that were true in the past hopefully are no longer true in the future. Great. So as people might be typing more questions, uh, something I, I wanted to ask you um, is how you combine your knowledge in formal ontologies and logic and all that side that is very close to computer science and then the more um, geographical thinking. And I think your profile is very interesting in this relationship between, um, if you like, logic and, uh, and spatial. Well, that's an interesting question. So all of my work is published in, 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 in computer science or GS journals, I, I haven't made any contributions to geographic theory as such. I would I would certainly love to at some stage, but I'm more on the on the formal side of things. But what I for me personally, one of the insights is that the strengths that I'm drawing in my own research career is by applying geographic thinking or spatial thinking or even my background in ecology to come up with new ways to, for instance, design a machine learning architectures, and then always being surprised that they actually are quite powerful and outcompete, and sometimes by a very, very big margin, talking like two or 300% here, those more general models. Of course, you can always make the case that those more general models, well, they are more general, and we are doing something more specific about spatial data, 
But I believe that there's a realization in the machine community that that pure learning for the learning sake on general, general, general models doesn't carry very far. They, you know, they have a hard time admitting that they are now learning from us. So they are using an old term of an inductive bias, which in the old days meant something else. But they are basically these days using this term of an inductive bias to encode domain theory without having to admit that they need domain theory. My student works, Gang Cheng works on, on spatially explicit models where we try to explicitly encode the location of things on, on, on the surface of the globe. And initially we did this in a Euclidean space and we're already able to show difference. And now he's using this on the sphere, which is substantially more complicated and was able to show that he very dramatically outcompetes models in, in ecology for species diversity, where previously these more general models have ruled. So I'm very optimistic that we as, as spatial scientists have a very large role to play and the knowledge graphs and their, you know, their deep level of interconnectivity using location also makes the same story.